everybody, welcome to Ad America. My name is Hasna, one of the guests here in Ad America. For those of you who are new here and have no idea what Ad America is, well, Ad America is the US Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn about the United States. The time has finally come. We are so happy to let you know that we are open for visitors every day and we are so excited to welcome you back here. So come visit us at Ad America Jakarta. And also we hope you will find the event we have prepared for you today to be fruitful and engaging. The marine environment is a vital resource for life on Earth and performs a number of key environmental functions. It is our precious asset, a heritage that must be protected, conserved, and valuably, properly valued. Let's find out more on how we can take action to conserve and make the marine life more productive again on today's event that we'll be having, Knowledge at America, Dive Deeper into Marine Renewable Energy. But before we begin, we have a social media quiz for the audience, and the question for today is, True or false, marine renewable energy is an important mitigation effort against climate change. You may type in your answer at any time during the session. The lucky one who can guess the answer correctly will get a live shout out from us by the end of this event. Don't forget to do that because we really like to get everyone actively involved in this event. Other than that, don't forget to take a selfie and tag at America's Instagram account. And now, without further ado, allow me to invite our moderator for today's session, a maritime practitioner, Mas Aryo Danurdoro Widodo. The floor is yours. Wiseman says, eternity begins and ends with ocean side. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's sessions at, at America. Today, we have three amazing speakers that will speak about the renewable energy. Sea is everything. Two-thirds of our world is sea, with water. So we'd like to provide to you today um, topics that are very rich from three diff different speakers. The first one is Man Wo Eng. He's a professor and, ma and maritime researcher. The second one is Ahmad Firdaus, lecturer in ocean engineering program at the Institute of Technology, Bandung. And the last one is Regit Triantoro. Doctoral researcher at Newcastle University. So, without further ado, let's have the first stations from the Professor Man Wo Eng. He's, professor Man Wo Eng is a professor of maritime and supply chain management at Old Dominion University, Virginia. He's, he's also a researcher that focuses on maritime analytics, featured in Blum, Bloomberg News, American Association of Port Authorities, Seaports Magazine, and the Journal of Commerce. Consultant and researcher for the Virginia Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Transportation and Private Business. Without further ado, please, Manuel. Mm. Thank you, Hasna. Hello, Indonesia. I'm Professor Manuel Ng from Old Dominion University. We're located in Norfolk, Virginia, on the east coast of the United States. I'm honored to share my passion for the maritime industry with you today as part of this year's celebration of National Maritime Day. I hope that you find the presentation insightful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Today, I'll be giving a quick and high level overview of ocean shipping covering a host of topics from its importance to containerization and some of the challenges facing the industry. The maritime industry has a long history of 5,000 plus years. Despite this, the awareness of the industry among the general population is low. The key reason for this lack of awareness and appreciation is really because the maritime industry is invisible to the majority of the people, unless you live in a coastal area. In fact, 
around 90% of world trade, which is billions tons of cargo, is shipped using the maritime mode of transportation. Maritime shipping is especially suitable for long distance international trade because of its cost effectiveness and how environmentally friendly it is compared to other modes of transportation. The segment of ocean shipping that I will be focusing on is container shipping. Besides container shipping, there are other segments such as bulk and passenger shipping that I will not be able to talk about today. Container shipping has experienced rapid growth since the invention of the shipping container in 1956 by American entrepreneur Malcolm McLean. One might think that the container is just a metal box, but its impact on the global economy has been tremendous. Almost everything that we buy today, such as TVs, clothes, shoes, furniture, are imported from abroad, and they are made more affordable and within our reach because of the shipping container. What has made a container so successful is the standardization of its dimensions. For example, a 20 foot container, also referred to as a TEU, or a 20 foot equivalent unit, has certain standard dimensions. It is 20 foot long, 8 foot wide, and so on. What you will also see very often is the 40 foot container, which is twice as long as the 20 foot container. Because of standardization, loading and unloading cargo and the speed at which cargo can move across the globe have seen tremendous improvements. For example, loading cargo would have cost almost $6 per ton before the shipping container. Now, it costs only 16 cents. Before the shipping container, one could only load 1.3 tons of cargo per hour onto a ship. Now, with containers, more than 10,000 tons of cargo can be loaded onto ships within an hour. All this makes the TV, the clothes, the computers that we buy a lot less expensive and readily available. Because of this effect, cost effectiveness and efficiency, these days almost everything that fits into a container is shipped inside a container. Containers are transported on container ships. The largest container ship is currently the Ever Ace, which can carry almost 24,000 TEUs. That's a lot of containers. This ship is absolutely huge. And it fits within the trends in the maritime industry where ships have grown bigger and bigger over the years. The left figure here shows you the evolution of the size of container ships over the last few decades. For example, you can see that in 1968, we had container ships of about 1,500 TEUs. In 2020, on the other hand, we have the HMM Al Jazeera's of about 24,000 TEUs. So to give you an idea of how gigantic these ships are, you can look at the right figure here, which shows the HMM Al Jazeera's in comparison to other large structures. You can see that it's taller than the Eiffel Tower and nearly as tall as the Empire State Building in New York City. The reason why ships have become so large is economies of scale. Particularly, larger ships lowers the unit cost. That is, it costs less to ship one container if the ship is larger. And a side benefit is that larger ships lowers the unit emission. 
In other words, the emissions generated in transporting one container is less if the ship is larger. The growth in container shipping is also reflected in the container ports that load and unload these containers from the ships. This slide shows the top 10 largest container ports in the world based on 2020 data. For example, you can see that the largest container port is the port of Shanghai that handled more than 43 million TEUs. And the amount of TEUs it handled has only grown over the years from 37 million TEUs in 2016 to over 43 million in 2020. While no Indonesian port ranks in the top 10, there's actually one port in Jakarta that is ranked number 23 in the world, handling more than 6 million TEUs in 2020, which is still very significant. If the growth and ubiquity of ocean shipping challenges can be expected, Two key challenges that I want to highlight are port congestion and decarbonization. The current pandemic has quite unexpectedly resulted in unprecedented congestion at ports worldwide due to consumer demand patterns that are changing and all kinds of disruptions. This has resulted in long delays getting our goods increases in transportation costs, and so on, threatening the very benefits of ocean shipping. The second challenge concerns the carbon footprint of the maritime industry, which fits within the broader call in society to decarbonize. The IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which is part of the United Nations, has called for shipping to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050, compared to the year 2008. While there's still time, this is a very ambitious goal. Having said that, I do not want to give you the impression that maritime shipping is very unsustainable, because it is not. In fact, Ocean shipping is very clean compared to other modes of transportation. For example, in this figure, you can see that ocean shipping only emits 1% of the carbon dioxide on a per ton kilometer basis compared to air transportation. That is very efficient. It is simply because of the skill of maritime shipping Recall that earlier I mentioned that about 90% of world trade is waterborne. In fact, one study has estimated that, they, that if we combine all cargo ships, they would generate enough greenhouse gas emissions to be ranked as the sixth biggest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So there is certainly room for the maritime industry to contribute to a more sustainable future. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you all a happy National Maritime Day. Wow, amazing presentations from Hong Wu that has explained us about the importance of containerizations in order to achieve efficiency and energy um, efficiency in the maritime shipping. Thank you all. I hope that will enrich the audience um, understanding towards the maritime shipping. Once again, thank you. And the next, we have another amazing speaker, which is Ahmad Firdaus. Ahmad Firdaus is a lecturer at Institute of Technology Bandu in the, in the Department of Ocean Engineering Program. He is a researcher on marine renewable energy, such as tidal stream energy and wave energy. He is also involved in many research projects on marine renewable energy in collaboration with Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. He also led a T4 feasibility study and master plan of Patimban Port 
and the study of Kuala Tanjung International Port. He is educated by at University of, of, of Oxford in the Marine Renewable Energy for his PhD. Without further ado, please welcome uh, Ahmad Ferdaus. Ahmad Ferdaus, please. Okay, thank you, Aryo. Um, hi, all. Um, I would like to present my, uh, I would like to share my presentation here. Okay. Um, yeah, I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, my title is about the ocean energy, uh, ocean renewable energy perspective in Indonesia. So I'll talk about all technology in this, in, in this, in this field. And then I, uh, I elaborate some, some of the a key point of Indonesia's future for uh, renewable energy. So I'll talk through the, the, the legal framework and I'll talk to the, the business, uh, the, the, the economic aspect also in, from renewable energy. This is the outline of the, my presentations. So in the beginning, I'll talk about the introductory background. This is about the, what I have been done previously on, on this field. And then maybe I can share some of experiences with you here. Okay, uh, first, um, I did my master in ITB. I did my, uh, my bachelor and my master in ITB. So um, on my master thesis, I developed um, uh, a tidal turbine. So which is this turbine is, um, we, we got a new idea of, of how to harness the energy from the tidal stream. And then this, this turbines, uh, drew an attention from the um, uh, uh, for, uh, from the Ministry of uh, Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Uh, they funded our research uh, to install these turbines in, in 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 the field. So in the beginning, we chose some some of the near uh, location nearby. So we chose the uh, exhaust channel from the uh, Muara Karang uh, coal fire for them, which is this is quite. Um, uh, interesting because uh, you can imagine that we test the renewable energy in this in the coal fire power plant, and then um, this is the, the the testing. So I'm just saying, tell this, this is the our our um, uh, experience uh, um, on, on doing testing in the field, and then um, unfortunately, what we got is just too many rubbish in that in that channel, and then so we got this um, our turbine has been. Um, is broken down because we got uh, a bad mattress stuck in this in this urban. So we moved to, to the more control facility. So we moved to the uh, laboratory hydrodynamic Indonesia in Surabaya. Uh, it's under BPPT. So we, we we still have this funding. So we develop our our another another prototype and do the test in the towing tank. Uh, so this is the testing. And this is the, the 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 example of the testing in these locations. So we are yeah we 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 did the testing and the the, the turbine performed well in this this uh, towing tank. So we have uh, quite positive. So uh, by the way, these turbines um, brought me to Oxford actually. So because of I developed this turbine, this turbine has um, actually new ideas. It's quite similar like uh, for, for with the. Uh, turbine that has been developed in Oxford as well. So it's in the beginning, it's just like I just conversation with have uh, with my uh, supervisor in Oxford, and then he he offered me to uh, whether I can uh, I would like to continue my study in Oxford. So yeah, I went to Oxford in 2016. So this this um, yeah, uh, unfortunately we have to stop this 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 study this this research because of my my departure to Oxford. So, but we, but before I leave, so we we managed to test this this uh, turbines in the Suramadu Bridge like this. Uh, but yeah, we uh, have we, yeah actually we don't have any chance to uh, develop this turbine turbine further, and then uh, this research has been stopped uh, in 2016. So hopefully we can continue later on this this um, on, on on doing this this uh, developing this turbines. So this is my, my background of experiences uh, doing research on uh, marine renewable energy. is 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 quite long. So just 2010 2016 before I leave to Oxford. Okay, before I start my presentations on the perspective on Indonesia, I would like to share with you these maps. If you how you can see the maps in in, in the screens, this map is the is actually uh, a, a nightlight 
uh, map of Indonesia. As you can see, this is the 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 you know, I, I super being close with this. So so to make it clear, I, I make the the the, the line of uh, Indonesian maps here, and that is actually uh, from from the satellite image. Um, you can see that um, Indonesia maybe we have um, disparity of uh, access to energy. So it's like say so this is uh, annual uh, exposure of Indonesian. So it's not. It doesn't mean in some area here there is no electricity, but even though they have electricity, it's not reliable. For example, in certain area, the electricity may be you can you can have electricity for one day, and another day you will have uh, you will lose the connectivity to, to electricity. You will have um, only in Java you can have twenty four seven electricity um, access. Um, yeah, well, only few people in Java can have that. So we get lucky for this. And a lot of our um, fellow Indonesians that might not have um, this luxury as us in, in Java. So they, they may might only have one day uh, of electricity, in other days they, they, they need to, um, yeah, they need to, to, to do all the activity without electricity. So you can imagine this one. So this is the situation of Indonesia at the moment. And when we talk about the um, marine renewable energy sources, uh, uh, at the moment we can we can divide it into into several types. The first one is a tidal energy, um, so it's, it's 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 different with the tidal stream energy. So as you see here, I I put the tidal energy and tidal stream energy. Why? Tidal energy is like what you if you um, have chance to Google on the um, uh, tidal barrage. It's actually tidal energy is about tidal barrage. We do have potential here, but it's not much, only two locations as far as I know. Um, but um, if, if you ever heard that about the Larang, so Larang is one of the oldest tidal barrage in the world. If you go to the UK, if you see that, uh, maybe you will see that a lot of plans to develop tidal barrage in the Swansea Bay uh, on Bristol Channel. Um, yeah, they, yeah, but Indonesia, unfortunately, is not as much as that. We have, we do have this, this high, uh, uh, the high tidal range, for example, in, in Merauke or, or in Bagan Siapi Api, in the West uh, uh, Indonesians. Uh, but we, we as an archaeological country, we have a lot of potential for tidal stream energy. I will talk through this uh, later on. And we also, as as a country that's located the, uh, in in the in the equator, we do have, we also have the potential for ocean thermal energy conversion, or we call it as OTEC. And also, uh, we all, we have the wave energy uh, potential as well. There are another type type of ocean energy, but I will not. Um, maybe we don't have chance to discuss about it. So we have the some some of the salinity gradient and, and etc. I'll talk other type of energy such as uh, offshore wind turbines and uh, uh, offshore floating uh, uh, solar PV, maybe uh, later on in this in this uh, presentations. Okay, so this is the the um, uh, just a bit um, of the overview about the the technology that occur in the market at the moment. So as you see that, the, for example, in the tidal. Uh, uh, tidal turbine. There are two types that um, um, that that don't predominantly occur in the in the market. Uh, the one that's what we call it is for horizontal axis turbine. The second one is we call it the vertical axis turbine. We do have another one so, such as tidal kite, oscillator hydrofoils, and ventral free effect turbine. But this one is is not as promising as the other type. But looking for the development development of the Wind turbine, the horizontal axis turbine is much more attractive for turbine developer at the moment. As you see, for the wave, is more varied than, than the, the, the uh, tidal stream turbine. As you see, only the point observer that has um, the, the, um, more, uh, more devices at the moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, but the other type is also have the same. Uh, if you see, see the, the percentage here, have the same chunk uh, in the business here. 
Okay, this is the, 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 the type of the, what we call it the type, the, the typical of the wave energy conversions, as I mentioned before. Uh, maybe as you see in the, in the, in the beginning of, this, of the video, of the teaser video of the At America, you can see that uh, illustration of the, what we call it the Pelamis. So the Pelamis is typ typical of the attenuator. So, so this is the point absorber, the typical of uh, move uh, uh, vertically. Uh, this is the example. So this is the submerged pre pressure, and this is the flap type, and this is also the, the southern duct, uh, which is, is, is more di different than the other. So uh, the wave energy is more varied than, than the other um, type of the ocean renewable energy. And um, we also have the ocean thermal energy conversions. What is it? Because the, as you know, that the ocean is the largest capacity, uh, capacitor, I mean, the capacitor uh, in, the, uh, in, in our planet. So they can contain heat for, for quite a long time. If you have a chance to go to, uh, uh, you can you can you can um, compare if you have a chance to go to the beach in the in the northern hemisphere, let's say in the Europe or in the U.S., you will find that um, the electricity, uh, I mean, so, sorry, the the water temperature in the oceans, they are in much colder than here. Here is 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 very warm. If you go to the the beach in Bali is, is, is really nice to put on your feet inside uh, in, in the water and um, because it's warm it's 30 degrees but if you go to deep down to the oceans that the the, the 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 temperature of the ocean only in four degrees the the temperature gradient if you if you make them meet each other it can it can create uh, energy it, it can move, move turbine here by the difference of the temperature from the below water to the, the, the above water here. However, this, uh, this technology is still quite expensive. Uh, so uh, only few that has been developed in the world at the moment is still in the research stage. But if you look for, for the potential, it's just, the potential is Indonesia. And this is what I said before. Uh, we have tidal barrage. So this is tidal turbine. So it's actually um, uh, uh, operates like uh, uh, hydropower, actually. So by the difference uh, water su water surface elevations between the from the apps and and um, and float during the, 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 the tidal cycle. So we we generate an, uh, energy here. So we know that there are two modes of operation. I will not talk um, in detail on it, but if you're interested to ask about this in detail, I'll, I'll have, I would be happy to, to answer it. So this is two, two of uh, uh, two of example here. One is already operated around uh, since 1960, I think the Laurents in France, but this one is still conceptual. UK still have um, uh, still striving to materializing this this project at the moment because it's. It's very expensive um, to develop this, this kind of um, uh, power plant, actually. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, there are two types of uh, uh, tidal streams. So, so this is different. The tidal streams just uh, generate electricity, electricity from the, the, the stream that generated by tide, actually. So the tides create the, the, the flow in the oceans, but the flow is moved back and forth uh, in, in the channel. Um, and then um, this one is a bit, uh, we, we use the, 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 the flow to move the, the turbine like this. There are uh, two types to, to, to um, I mean, what we call it, um, we can um, distinguish the turbine with, uh, from the axis. For this one is, we call it as cross flow turbine. And this one is, we call it as axial flow turbine. This one is also the, the one that I developed in, in, uh, in ITB uh, is also cross flow turbine. Only you, as you can see, this one, this one is um, uh, have different type of uh, different detail actually, but it's, as principle, we call it as cross flow turbine. And also, also developed two turbines. Uh, so one is the axial flow, this is uh, um, belong to a professor uh, Wilden uh, and his team, and this one is belong to my supervisor, Professor Holsby. 
So uh, it's actually work as the in similar like cross flow turbine, but they call it as transverse axis because it's not cross flow uh, as um, usually uh, what we can find in the market actually. Uh, this one is actually axial flow. This has been developed by the US. Uh, we call it as a open hydro uh, turbine. Uh, I think also Oxford already did some some experiment on this turbine as well, and I already have report what is the advantage and disadvantage of having this this type of turbine. But um, we also have another type of uh, uh, tidal streams um, power converter. As we, we call it as this uh, tidal sail. It's like tidal fans like this. But there are a lot of uh, another type. But but actually at the moment um, that look promising is that this type or this type. By theory, this type should be the most promising turbines uh, at the moment. But we it's we it it's really hard to handle the, the material for this uh, type of turbine compared to this one. But as you see, as I mentioned before, the a lot of um, uh, major player. So this is the major player into uh, uh, and and as you see the turbine turbine scale um, uh, uh, um, that available in the market. So most of them is the axial flow, as you see here, and um, this is the, the 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 major player of the turbine at the moment. And we also have potential for uh, offshore wind turbines. This this offshore wind turbine is the one of the most um, promising, have you see this in, in, in Europe and maybe in the Canada, and I think I believe US also started to, to develop the uh, offshore wind turbine as well at the moment, is one of the most promising source of the renewable energy in the future. So we are no longer look um, the opportunity and, uh, on the land, on the shore, uh, on, on the shore, but we go farther to the sea. Um, the turbines when we so this is the example so the the the, the uh, offshore wind turbines uh, become more and more deeper uh, installed in more and more deeper water at the moment so they have to change their superstructure from the fixed structure to the floating one i can uh, i can discuss about it later on but i think i need to keep um, as simple as possible these presentations and uh, having turbine in the oceans um, is we are we have lot of advantage. The first one, uh, we don't have to deal with it, what we call it as uh, physical pollution or noise pollution because it's quite farther from the uh, um, municipal area, which just has been protested by, by many people in, 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 in either in Europe or in the US because uh, the noise of the wind turbine sometimes disturb them. Uh, but having to bind in the in the in the offshore, I think so we we already tackled that problems. But at the same time, uh, wind offshore wind turbine def, um, operates much better than than uh, when it's uh, um, than if we install it on, on the land, because as you see, this, if this is the the, the uh, simplification of the what we um, abstraction from the land. So for example, we have tree, we have buildings, we have everything create the uh, what we call it as um, uh, shear, shear force uh, to, the, to the wind flow, and then it makes the fin much lower in the land. But in the ocean, they don't have this, that, this one. So we will have the wind uh, blowing much stronger in, uh, on the ocean than uh, on the land. And um, as a country uh, in the tropical area, so I think so we also have uh, potential for installing the solar PV. However, installing the problem solar PV require um, a huge amount of land, which is in Indonesia because this country is covered mostly either for, for, for uh, uh, either by, by, by um, uh, uh, household and everything, or uh, agriculture or forests. It's, it's, it's quite, I mean, it's quite um, disadvantage for us if we, uh, we if we try to have a very large area um, uh, for the solar PV power plants. The other, the other, the other uh, opportunity is to develop this uh, solar solar PV um, on the 
water body either in the in the reservoir for example on the lake on the uh, dam reservoir and one thing that we, we we might need to see is we can install it in offshore we can in, install this this one in the uh, ocean side so this is not just us uh, japan has already have this plan they already have uh, plan to move the floating solar power uh, uh, solar pv uh, photovoltaic to the uh, um, to the to the oceans because they are similar to us the land to, to the land acquisition is is to require huge amount of money in japan is similar to indonesia you have to purchase the lands just in order to to develop the uh, uh, to to install this this uh, for, uh, solar pv but in the oceans we have as much as we we need to install this one and um, when we think when we talk if we want to talk about the potential so actually in 2013 i developed this um, uh, technical notes actually the map for uh that's um, for indonesia's uh, resources so this is the first one is the for the tidal stream this is the potential arus laut as you see this is uh, has been issued by the PTGL, is actually the uh, research agency under Ministry of Energy and uh, Mineral Resources and EMR. Um, so we 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 show where is the uh, potential location for the tidal turbine. Uh, and this is potential location for the wave energy conversions, and this is the potential location for ocean thermal energy conversions. So as you imagine this one. In 2014, this, this number is still increased at the moment, but I use this one because this is the official numbers that have been issued by Indonesian uh, government. In 2019, uh, 14, so we all we calculated uh, the potential of ocean energies uh, can achieve around 60 gigawatt. You can imagine that the entire Indonesia at the moment, the capacity of the electricity uh, power, plant, power plant in Indonesia is only around 64.5 gigawatt. From the ocean itself, we already can provide more than 90% of the Indonesian need for the electricity. And as you see, this is the uh, for the wind turbine. So this is the wind maps of Indonesia. Maybe um, we don't have the uh, resources as much as uh, northern, um, uh, all the countries in the northern hemisphere. But as you see here, there are some locations that's actually um, a potential for to develop the wind energy here. We just need to think about how we can uh, deliver this, this electricity to other area. So as, as you see, that's the number of the population in the eastern Indonesia is not as much of number of population in the western area. What, uh, in the meantime, the potential of the wind turbine in this this region is is, is much higher than than the western of Indonesia. And within the 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 photovoltaic one, as you see here, uh, around from the eastern Java to the uh, eastern Nusa Tenggara here, we have um, potential for the uh, solar PV, but um, this one. We we might can use this one to 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 see the the, the opportunity on the offshore as well. Um, yeah. Um, for for doing the, the to see the, the but this is this is just just uh, some some general knowledge about the how we can we can see that um, the uh, want of the source of energy can be. Um, can be sold in Indonesia is like based on the price, actually, by based on the price that we can uh, apply to this this uh, this source of energy. We call it as a localized cost of energy. So the LCOE is calculated by by this uh, using this scheme. Uh, I will not go into detail in this in this, but uh, if you uh, have questions, I will be happy to answer it. And uh, we can simplify the LCOE like this. This is the calculations. Um, and then we can use the financial models of doing this uh, to see that whether the, 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 uh, the, flop, the flopping, that uh, the, the source of ocean and renewable energy is divisible 
is feasible in, in this country or not using this one. And we can calculate the life cost of energy. And based on that, we can have what kind of tariff we can implement to, to this, this uh, source of energy. And if we look to the legal framework of Indonesian energy provision, we have three options actually. The first option is owning an operational area. Um, the new regulation in 2021 allow a private sector to operate uh, an operational area. What is an operational area? This is usually a, 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 a regional that's been, um, you, most of the, the operational area is operated by uh, PLN at the moment, uh, but uh, new regulations allow uh, uh, private sector to enter the business. If PLNs cannot uh, provide the, the, the electricity in one area, maybe private sector can step in and, 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 uh, and own that operational area. But um, to be honest, in my, in my perspective, I think this is, is quite hard to do because most of the, the operational already has been operated by PLN, PLN already have a lot of investment in that area. And then uh, it's, it's, it's really hard for private sector to replace uh, PLN in certain area. The second one is the PPA contract scheme with PLN. It's the most common one. Um, but there are a lot of um, uh, regulation that we must follow because uh, uh, having cooperation with the PLN, which is the state-owned company, we must follow certain rules on this one. Uh, and we need to know about this. And the, sec the third one, I think this is the one of the interesting ones, is using the power wheeling scheme. This, this scheme actually is common in, 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 in Europe and the US actually, uh, but it's not common here. Uh, in 2019, in 2015, MOEMR, uh, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, uh, uh, issues a regulations number one um, that allowing uh, any private sector to run uh, a grid system of PLN. The PLN can, um, we can use the PLN grid system in, in order to deliver the electricity to, to the customer. Um, um, this one is just quite promising. However, since the, the regulation has been implemented, there is no power wheeling scheme uh, has, been, has, uh, has been done actually. There is no power wheeling scheme has been um, implement, implemented uh, uh, in this country. So it's like, um, uh, so it is, it is actually similar, the three for, for, uh, for uh, uh, wilayah usaha or operational area, PPA contract and power wheeling scheme. And this is the, uh, I would like to, um, to discuss more about the power wheeling scheme, but I think, uh, I don't know if I still have time or not. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll carry on. So yeah, another thing that we have to, con to, to, to consider is the, what we call it the electricity generation cost or biaya pokok pembangkit. Uh, we have to comply with these regulations, so we cannot. Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, we cannot implement our own tariffs. Actually, we have to follow these regulations. And the uh, energy provisions. This is the another challenge. Actually, so the uh, BPP is is varied from one can one uh, province to another province, one area to another area. We need to look carefully on this one. But we also have the Propex perspective because uh, we are we already ratified the uh, uh, net zero uh, carbon. Um, uh, we uh, we we pledge to uh, have net. Uh, uh, I mean to, to face out the coal uh, on 2060. So I think the 2060 we will have. So government already have. Uh, uh, plan for the, for retiring the the coal uh, uh, coal fire power plant, and at the moment we already start what we call it the desalination pro, uh, programs. So uh, government at the moment is start to retiring around five thousand two hundred um, diesel power. Uh, uh, this is the locations. Maybe we can we can have this opportunity. Using this this um, this program, I mean, that's all uh, from me. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, return to uh, Ario.
Wow, that's that's a wholesome introductory of maritime <laughs> technology from Fahmat Perdao. Thank you so much. That's very deep. Okay. It reminded me of my first class in the couple of years back, actually. Thank you, Pa much. And next, we'll have uh, another amazing speaker. He is a doctoral researcher at Newcastle University. He has experience as a research analyst for maritime consultant in Singapore. He is also a worthy of the LPDP scholarships from the government of Indonesia. He is educated from Erasmus University Rotterdam and currently pursuing doctoral in Newcastle in the subject of uh, maritime economics or logistics, more or less. Please give round of applause to Ugit Triantoro. The screen is yours. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mas Aryo, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear my voice right now? Yes, yes. Am I clear? Okay. So uh, basically, uh, the two speakers, the, the first two speakers, speakers have been uh, delivered a very amazing uh, knowledge about what happened in maritime between renewable energies and also uh, shipping industry. And then uh, in this occasion, I would like to present to you like the, the missing part of it, like uh, how the renewable industry uh, energies can enforce the development of green port. So I would like to speak more about uh, Green port because basically, uh, I'm a first year uh, PhD student in Newcastle University, so uh, I'm still doing a literature review right now. So I'm I'm trying to share to you all about what I have found uh, in the green port area. So you might uh, ask yourself right now, what is a green port? So basically, uh, I would uh, green port is. Uh, can be defined as a port that encourages pollution prevention, clean technology, clean shipping, and clean port operation to minimize or eliminate the negative externalities in the port itself. So I would uh, go back to the material from uh, Prof. Manwu again that there are basically two things that happening or two challenges, two key challenges in uh, maritime sector, which is the first one is port congestion and decarbonization, and it has been delivered uh, very well by uh, Professor Manwu. Uh, and he mentioned a lot about uh, the decarbonization in uh, shipping sector. As we know, uh, that international maritime organization has targeted to decrease 50% of carbon emission or greenhouse gases from uh, maritime sector by 2050 compared to 28 level. But then it speaks a lot in the shipping sector or in specifically in international international shipping sector. But what happened in port? As we know that shipping and seaports are interconnected with each other, the question of how to ensure the long-term sustainability of port sector is becoming an important issue right now. However, unlike the shipping sector, uh, there are no standard, there is no uh, unilateral uh, standard of how green ports should be developed. I would like to mention several aspects or uh, agreement from the international communities to decarbonize the shipping sectors. The first one is, or the, uh, the most obvious one, is the use of alternative fuels, because basically right now, almost 97% of marine uh, transport are fueled by heavy fuel oil or marine diesel. These are, uh, when burned, will produce a high level of CO2 or even NOx or uh, SOx and other particle that matters. But then, International Maritime Organization, one of the entity from United Nations, uh, has mandated for all the commercial shipping to use uh, less or low carbon vessel fuel, such as LNG. Because LNG or liquefied natural gas has 
pro, uh, only produce around 25% of CO2 uh, carbon emission compared to marine diesel, as I said uh, earlier. But then, what happens in port? We do still uh, believe that uh, port around the globe still find the exact or uh, good way to decarbonize itself. And uh, although although uh, IMO or International Maritime Organization has uh, definitely defined that they want to reduce 50% uh, of the carbon emission by 2020, uh, I think there is no really, I think in my opinion, yeah, there is no really a good consensus be done from uh, all multi stakeholders from maritime industry, from port authority, shipping lands, and etc. to really uh, deliver this uh, timely in by 2050. In fact, the target that I have mentioned earlier, or even Prof. Manwu has said about decreasing 50% uh, by 20, 2050, it is an old uh, agreement by 2018. Uh, and currently, the international communities in maritime sector still discussing about what should be done and would like to ref, uh, uh, revise the strategy by 2023. So next, we need to know how, as I mentioned, because there is no unilateral uh, definition of green port, we need to know what are indicators that can be used for us to understand what is green port. So basically, there are few uh, relevant uh, research be done uh, from 2014 until now. Basically, the, the green port uh, terminology itself is official was officially uh, proposed during uh, one of the convention by United Nations in 29, uh, 2009. Sorry, 2009. So this uh, field is still developing. So there are still few relevant. Uh, research or literature that talk about it. But mainly, uh, or the similarities of the determinants of green port, we can, uh, we, can in, we can take it as how a port can control the pollutants in port, such as air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, even noise pollution. And this should be incorporated into their uh, standard of uh, operational procedures. And all this can be done uh, basically uh, with the implementation of energy saving technologies and also the use of low carbon alternative fuels, not to mention the, the use of renewable energies that has been uh, covered very well by Pak Ahmad previously. And next, I would like to emphasize, emphasize, sorry, emphasize uh, one of the key uh, effort that can be done to minimize uh, the, the the CO2 emission or greenhouse gases emission in ports. Uh, maybe you can remember the picture that I shared in the first uh, slide. Uh, there are actually several steps to do or uh, to do in import from uh, loading and unloading in key site until uh, taking cargo in uh, yard area until you deliver it to the uh, end customer in the land side, right? But then one of the most pollutant uh, uh, area that can be uh, distinguished in port basically happen in key site, where even when the vessel is motionless, the emission coming from the auxiliary engines for the hoteling phase still be identified as one of the large share of the port pollutants. And what is the hoteling phase? So I would like to say that uh, it is more related to cargo and uh, cargo loading and unloading operation at ports. So basically, uh, if the vessel have bird in the say one port, and then they need to load and unload their cargo, they need to still turn on the 
engines and they do not turn on the main engine uh, but then uh, they they turn on the auxiliary engines and this still using a lot of uh, marine fuel that uh, burn co2 emission so then by using an onshore power supply we can reduce that uh, emission uh, tremendously because the thing is when we use the onshore power supply we use the the same electricity that we uh, use uh, in household uh, in households yeah so then uh, the vessel uh, not uh, the vessel shouldn't have to turn on their auxiliary engine so there is, there is no marine diesel fuel or any other fuel any other fuel that uh, has to be burned during the process of uh, loading and unloading cargo we say on shop power supply but sometimes uh, uh, a marine maritime practitioners usually say it as a called ironing because as engines are constructed from iron turning the engine off while in port means the vessel is obtaining their energy requirements while the iron is cold that's why we call it as called ironing okay but then the efficiency or its efficacy in terms of emission reduction emission reduction depends on the proportion of the renewable energy that generated in that country say in indonesia we we would like to uh, reduce the you know the emission import by the, uh, by implementing the onshore power supply or we say it as called ironing, ironing but then the power station that supply electricity to the port still using a coal uh, still using coals as their main 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 power main, main material so it real in developing countries it really hard to to really uh, you know uh, reduce the carbon emission import because you just uh, somehow you just like uh, move the carbon emission to other stage which is in in this in this uh, case we move it to the carbon emission in the power station then the question must be asked what should we do as a developing countries to improve the power su power supply for uh, for for uh, yeah I mean for supplying electricity to ports uh, a case study has been done with, uh, from Sadek and El Gohari in 2020, uh, researching the potential of supplying port of Alexandria in Egypt uh, using uh, an offshore wind turbines and also combination with uh, fuel cells or using a solar panel. So uh, we need to know that Alexandria is a center of marine passenger traffic. So it, uh, this study is uh, uh, was held uh, in one of the biggest marine uh, passenger terminal in uh, Egypt. So the result is uh, from from using uh, 25 wind turbines and also combine it with 20 fuel cell units with a capacity of uh, 37.5 megawatt and 20, 20 eh, 37.5 million eh, megawatt sorry and 20 megawatt respectively we can see that the annual emission reduction could be potentially reduced by almost in total like uh, 80,000 tons per year while there is also a uh, cost saving competitiveness that can be uh, can be get can uh, can be uh, can, can be get by 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 the port operator by stream 0.8 million US dollar per, per year. So this is a uh, good examples or good uh, as it can be good example to to motivate other developing countries to uh, improve their uh, power supply using the re renewable energies. And you 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 can see the material from Pak Ahmad previously that uh, he already mentioned that Indonesia has a good potential in tidal waves or even several other like uh, what i would like to highlight is the floating 
solar panel because indeed we we need a lot of uh, land to in order to have a uh, to harness the electricity from solar panel but if we use it if we if we use floating uh, solar panel and as an archipelagic country it will benefit us more <clears throat> the next one there are some challenge to develop green port in developing countries actually so uh study done by song in 2011 said that because basically in developing countries there are already existing old ports right so <clears throat> these old ports already come into service decades ago even if you uh, visit several ports in eastern of, if, eastern of indonesia we still do operate the port with the full human muscle without no automatic or even uh, sophisticated uh, equipment like uh, automatic uh, uh, rubber tire grain crane sorry or, or we call it as RTG we do not have it at all so I have an experience to go to 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 go to Sorong port and we do still we can i i i could see that in order to move container from the ship to uh yard we still need a human muscle to connect the container to the to the crane so it's very uh, challenging basically <clears throat> to improve this situation and Point number two and point number three, basically, uh, it is because the uh, low quality of the human resource in develop uh, in developing countries, because we do not really uh, have a good consciousness about the environmental protection. So I think to tackle this issue, we really need to improve our human resource by training the uh, by training the employees of the port to improve environmental performance. And lastly, maybe uh, actually, I I met this slide without knowing about uh, what would uh, Pak Ahmad share previously. So basically, I just want to connect it uh, with the potential of tidal waves. And in fact, this material uh, I got it from one of the paper of Pak Ahmad. So thanks, Pak Ahmad. So basically, this uh, uh, as as Pak Ahmad has already mentioned, we have uh, officially we have ten potential location for tidal wave. Maybe with combining uh, with our uh, 636 uh, seaports that we have, we could make a better uh, or we could make a better improvement of green port development in, in our country. So that's it from me. Uh, I will give it back to Mas Aryo. Thank you. Amazing, Mas Ugit. Uh, thank you so much for explaining about your research related to the topic that we, discuss, that we are discussing today. So now we are we are arrived in the discussion sessions, and now I will lead the discussions today. Since Pa Ahmad, Ungwo, and also Masugit has explained a lot about this topic from different point of view, from different expertise, I'd like to um, mix all those knowledge that I have um, absorbs from all the great speakers today. So I think I'll start with the questions that is quite simple. Um, anyone can answer this question. So basically when we are talking about renewable energy, when we're talking about energy in general, we are talking about the steady supply, right? And for example, the photovoltaic or the, or the solar cells, one of the challenges is the in, uh, in availability of sun in the, in the night. Therefore, we are using batteries. And when you're talking about um, sea waves or sea energy, how does it look like the availability and the consistency of energy to be uh, supplied to the, to, the, to the market, to the public? I, I think this question should be uh, appropriate, but if Ahmad <laughs> answer it. But. Okay, you, you okay? You you asked the question to us, are you? I saw you asked the question to, to the audience. Okay, uh, yes. Um, the, the the 
the problem with the, the renewable energy is um, intermittency. So um, as you mentioned before, that um, photovoltaic um, only occur on, on only only available on, on the daytime. It's not available it's in, in the, the, the uh, nighttime. Um, the most of the uh, renewable energy, including tidal stream, including the wave, including wind, is also intermittent. Um, However, from most of the, only, only OTEC is not intermittent. So if we have OTEC, maybe uh, we, we calculate this, this intermittency as a capacity factors. Capacity factors is the, what is the, the maximum energy that can be produced by a systems from, over the, uh, I mean, the, the average uh, energy that, can, that, that produced by the system over the maximum, maximum energy that uh, can produce by the, the, the system or the capacity of the system. So it's called capacity factors. So for example, for your diesel power, for your coal power, 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 power plants, you will have the capacity factor around 85%. So the average um, production is will be 85% from the maximum uh, energy productions. But in, in wind turbine, for example, we only look for 35 to 40% of the capacity factors. Um, when we try to design the systems, we, we try to, 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 to aim for uh, 35 to 40% of the capacity factors. It's already meet the feasibility of the, uh, uh, of, of, uh, I mean, the, um, it's, it's already feasible. I mean, however, as you mentioned before, we might need the support systems, which is the battery, the storage of the energy. It's not just battery. For example, if, if you, uh, in, in the UK, they have what we call as a hydro pump electricity system, uh, storage system. So when they have the electricity, they, they will produce the electricity more than they need. So the, 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 the excess of the electricity, they'll pump the water to the higher crown. When they need the, 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 the electricity, they, 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 let the, they release the water. The water will, will move the, this is like a simple hydroelectric system. But instead of they have, um, uh, um, I mean, they have um, a source from from the nature. They 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 just they just uh, put the water in, in that in that in that location. There are there are another type of the energy storage system. This is there is a mechanical storage and also another system. Um, yeah, um, battery is another challenge. Uh, maybe we can we can explore more later on. Sure, sure. Perhaps, Mr. Gip, you do you have anything to add, or otherwise, I have a particular questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I just want to add. Uh, sometimes we need to collaborate from many many stakeholders, right? Because uh, in order to develop uh, renewable energies, as maybe I have shown in my one of my slides, uh, there are a lot of challenges. So. Basically, I also have an experience to work in one of the private uh, entities in Indonesia, uh, which is uh, that mainly focus on the infrastructure section. So basically, in order to uh, realize this project, we, we, we really need a high capital in, in, in intensive, right? So I think, I think uh, we need to collaborate uh, between uh, government and also private not only with state owned enterprise even i mean like all in or even con uh, connect it with the good findings from every academics or researchers in indonesia to to make it come true because that's it uh, that's why I, one of the research question that i'm going to do right now in uh, my phd is to to see from the investment appraisal of it. So we would like to see whether this is economically uh, beneficial or not. Because uh, I really believe that uh, we, uh, technically it could be implemented in Indonesia. But then the question must be asked uh, whether the investors would like to invest in this project, in this renewable project or not, whether if it, uh, it will give them a profit or not. So. That's why I I think uh, really need, we really need to collaborate uh, all the stakeholders in Indonesia. 
that's what I want to add from Ahmad. Thank you. Cool answers from both speakers, and I agree with both. So basically, the idea is about uh, understanding the characteristics of each um, energy resources. And on the other hand, we also need to expand the partnerships, the collaborations between all stakeholders to make sure that all things work. Awesome answers. And uh, perhaps I'll have a particular patience for um, as for Um When I remember when I was young, I went to I, I went to a, a, a port and I, I I took a boat with my families. And I remember the wind is really strong. And previously, Bahamat explained about the sheer force, if I recall correctly, but zero resistance due to inevitability of trees in the, in, the, in the middle of the sea. Will it be possible for ships to install some kind of small wire turbines, perhaps on top of the vessel, perhaps on the, the copper hedge or in the uh, forecastle deck? What do you think about that? That that's such an interesting question. Actually, uh, I don't know whether we could do it because I'm not a really hardcore engineer. Uh, so my my area of expertise uh, mostly in uh, maritime economics and logistics. But then I would just to I would like just to mention that there is one uh, type of vessels that can be uh, you know can can sell using uh, wind energy. Uh, I don't know what is the name, but the the, the thing is, it it's they they do not use sail mm. to to capture the winds, but they use some kind of a uh, motor that like a huge uh, tube uh, on deck to to that that uh, you know rotate while there is a wind. Mm -hmm. So I think I just want I want to say that. Uh, the technology kind of are there uh, already, but then can it uh, be used to uh, power uh, or not only the ship, but can it can it be used to maybe to, can we, can we use them to store them uh, to store the energy in the battery so we can use it later? I I, I still don't know the the right answer for it, but the 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 technology already there. Okay, awesome. Thanks for the update, Mas uh, uh, pa, pa, Ahmad, do you have anything to say regarding to my yeah. questions? Um, actually, there, there are. Um, I remember previously when I uh, presenting in, 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 in one, I think it's, it's called, um, so they, they have plans. So actually, it's not for, for, for uh, powering the, the boat itself or for the ship itself, but powering for the other source of electricity because the, 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 the ship itself Need electricity for the, the light, for the, the instruments and everything. They have that. So they, they generate electricity from the wind. It's not as big as to, 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 um, to, to, to move the, the propeller, but this can power up the, 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 the vessel. And, and, and this one is, as, as, as we get also mentioned that about the, the collaborations, indeed. I, I'm sorry, I just said move back to, to the previous, uh, previous answer from the Wigit. Um, um, so, so for example, in Patimban at the moment, so as, as you may know that in, from my CV is that I uh, involved in many uh, port developments, so I involved in Patimban port. So they also have um, idea um, how to uh, provide the electricity for, from, from the renewables. The idea is from the, the, the photovoltaics at the moment. And also at the moment, I'm involved in the uh, in one of the major projects in Indonesia as well. This is for the port in the North Kalimantan uh, or North Borneo. So they have um, planned to build a very large uh, industrial park. In that location is if you look, if you Google it, it's just a few months ago, Pajoko, we went there and then do the, the groundbreaking for that project. So they uh, also have plans to, to provide the, uh, all the source of energy from, from the renewables, actually. But the idea is from the hydroelectric. So this idea has already been, already been here, actually. So as, as Pawegi has said before, that this, this, this collaboration is being um, uh, forced at the moment uh, in order to, be, to materialize the idea of the, uh, uh, having a smart port, green port, 
uh, that's um, the the energy from the the renewable energy, including the ships, as your your question before. Ariel. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, we have um, we have a questions from the audience that attend the session today. It is from DJ Swamintaya, and his he or she is asking through Zoom. The question is, which one is more beneficial and more prospective when mar marine energy or sun energy? Indonesia is located in tropical area. Why we just give a little bit of attention for sun energy? Meanwhile, in Mekong River, they cover it with their equipment to try to capture energy from sunshine. It's open questions to both speakers. Maybe Mas Wigit have uh, some thoughts on it. Uh, no, I think it's better for Pahma to cover this because it's her, uh, it's it's his area of expertise. Sure, please, Pahma. Yeah, um, actually, we do have um, this attention for the uh, photovoltaic at the moment. So, if you look for the Chirata uh, reservoir, if you look for uh, the Batam area, so most of it, the most of the new new. Uh, a uh, new power plant that has been developed that, that will that is the developed by by PLN uh, that will be developed by 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 PLN is uh, photovoltaic actually. However, I have to say this one. Even though we think we think that uh, uh, photovoltaic is very big in this country, but um, we have to see that our sky is not always clear. We have a lot of uh, cloud in the sky, which is make the, 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 the uh, effectiveness of the photovoltaic is not as high as in, 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 the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and also most of the area that's, uh, that's very potential require very large area. As you see now, uh, in order to develop the power plants, it's like a, a, a solar PV farm in, in the, on, on the land, you need to acquire huge amount of lands, which is, it's required a huge amount of money as well. You have to purchase the, the, the land in order to, to, to develop this one. Is the, the, the price will, will go higher. And at the same time, um, because we, um, we kind of country that's um, subsidized the source of energy to the, to the people, if you increase the tariff for the people, <laughs> you can imagine that what, what, what would be happens uh, next time. No government will 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 interested to do that in the future. No matter how how you can tell them how you can sell them, this is the green and renewable energy. If the prices go higher, even though the I believe even though some of the the environmental activists will join the, to the street and and doing the doing the protest as well in order to increase the the tariff to the people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe okay. I just want to comment one of the. Sure, sure, uh, sure. Let's go. Yeah. One of the answers from Pak Ahmad that that's true actually. So that's why uh, and it's imp really important to uh, study about the 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 econ the feasibility uh, in terms of uh, financial or economical aspect yeah, of any renewable energies in Indonesia that uh, that is categorized as a developing country because when we uh, try to implement. Uh, a high tariff to the end customer, there will be a lot of uh, commotion, right? That ha that will happen, uh, and then that I, I do. In, uh, I feel uh, I'm interested in one of the uh, technology that you has shown earlier, Pak Ahmad. Whether we would like to have a floating solar panel, because then maybe we would uh, have to. Uh, widen the opportunities to get to harness more energy by uh, using the the potential in our uh, ocean, right? So, don't you think that uh, this kind of technology could be one of the most prominent or most promising uh, projects in Indonesia, Pak? Maybe if I can ask also, Pak Ahmad. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's a discussion. You're still muted, Pak. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, uh, could you repeat it? Uh, because I, I lost your, your last sentence. Uh, yeah, I just wonder whether one of the, maybe we can, because uh, earlier the topic is about uh, fuel solar, right? So, yeah. or fuel, uh, photoelectric uh, 
tell. But then you also mentioned in your slides that there is a technology called a floating uh, fuel EV. cells. Yes. Yeah, EV, yeah. That's why, don't you think that this is one of the promise, promising projects that could be done to enforce renewable energies in Indonesia, Pak? Indeed, indeed. Um, yeah. This is the one of the promising uh, uh, project in the future of Indonesia because it's not require any land acquisitions for for this kind of projects. Um, however, not all locations can be uh, installed by by uh, photovoltaic because we need to find the location which is the uh, the uh, it's calm. It's not uh, in some certain area. For example, if you go to the the certain uh, Java. You will see that the, the, the wave is really high, is really hard, hard to install any kind of structure in that location. So we need to find that the location which is much more calmer than, than the other location. So which is, um, uh, and also the other challenges will be um, the tariff itself. Um, mm. Because in order to, at the moment, I think um, uh, only um, UAE can, can in, invest uh, in photovoltaic in terms of Indonesian BPP price. Uh, for example, they, they can sell the electricity below the BPP, which is the, in, in Java. In Java, BPP only six cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, they can sell it at around five cents. But if you look their financial models, they only use the IRR only 3%, which is not possible for other, other player. You can imagine that. You ask your the financial guy, so that, I think yeah. you, you can imagine that. So that's, that's if, the challenge, yeah. Or maybe if we could, couldn't absorb, absorb the uh, energy to the household industry, can we just, because you, you are also part of the Patimban team, but can we also just make the floating uh, solar panel in, next to the Patimban port so it can be absorbed by the industry itself? So, Kamali, Next to the port, there will be a lot of uh, manufacturer manufacturing companies, right? So it yeah. could be absorbed by them. How about it? Is it possible yes. to develop such kind of things? Indeed, indeed. That's that's the, the plan actually. So the plan is as we develop the the floating uh, solar PV uh, around the Patimbang port, which is the, the we we can choose the the much more calmer area. And sorry, and we sell it directly to the industrial in mm -hmm. the in, in the behind of the the port. We can do that. However, at the moment, we still struggle to find the, the configuration of the structure, which is that can meet the, uh, mm -hmm. the tariff uh, in this certain area, uh, in that area, actually. So for example, the industry only want to pay not, not higher than BPP from the location, so, which is a $6 uh, dollar, US dollar per kilowatt hour. And um, um, uh, how, for, for, for the flop, the, the uh, floating PV, we need another uh, layer of uh, protection layer from the of the solar PV, which is uh, uh, make the the, the tariffs um, cannot be lower. You can imagine we have uh, include some uh, part uh, that increase the capex price, uh, capex cost for, for for installing the solar PV in that area. That the the, the problem uh, still with the price actually. If there is no government involvement that allowing PLN to 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 purchase, if, even though we, we we sell the electricity to the industry much higher than BPP, but PLN cannot uh, buy the electricity from the IPP from the independent pro power product producer higher than the BPP that has been um, mentioned by 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 the the regulations. That's the other problem. We need we need the another discretion to do to do that. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, I have to intervene. Uh, we have a time constraint. Indeed, this is a very interesting discussion today. We have last questions, and what makes this question special is it's live from the stage. Hello, sir. Good evening. My name is Ingrid, and this is my friend, David. We are from Jakarta Aquarium and Safari. For some of you who don't know our place, our place is a conservation industry, we have a lot of animals and we're focusing on breeding the a lot of animals. 80% of our animals is from the marine and then the 20% is from the land. So I have uh, two questions for today. For the first, the first one, is there any effect with the animals, especially in the marine ecosystem, if we're focusing on marine renewable energy? 
And then question number two, how can we as a conservation industry can support or do some action for the, this renewable energy? Because, you know, our places have a lot of people, so I think we can influence people to do some big impact. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Perhaps Mohamed have uh, the, the opportunity to answer. And I'll yeah. Talk Okay. Yes. Uh, indeed, there, there, there are there are effects to the marine life. Actually, this is part of the, my my research, um, uh, my PhD research in Oxford. Actually, so I look for uh, for example when we install the uh, the tidal turbine in certain area of Indonesia, we need to carefully look for the migratory passage of blue whales. For example, we don't want the blue whale crash to the the turbines. So we need to, to be careful to place the turbines, which is not obstruct their migratory path. Um, so for example, we, we, maybe we, you don't know that, um, uh, maybe you, you, you know better than I do. We have migratory path for blue whales from the Australia to the Pacific through Indonesia. But the location sometimes is in the location where, where is uh, one of the potential location for the tidal turbines. And the other thing is that we 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 uh, consider is like a, to develop the technology that not move as fast as uh, current technology. For example, so for example, the turbine that only move very slow is can create create the same same amount of energy, but in consequences you you apply more torque on the on the turbine, but it still move very slow. So when the the whales goes or the other mammals, marine mammals or fish goes through the, 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 the propeller, they just they, they can survive with that kind of speed, actually. So this is the, 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 what we, we can do. What um, all the environmentalists or, or, or uh, environmental enthusiasts can do for, for um, promoting the renewable energy, maybe we need to understand um, having renewable energy is, we cannot have, we cannot materialize any kind of project of uh, 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 renewable energy without consequences of having uh, more expensive electricity from the beginning, in the beginning, I mean. But maybe later on, when we, we know better about this technology, maybe we can reduce the cost of to, to develop this, this technology. Maybe we can have much more cheaper electricity from, from that. But, but from for now, if we want to have this uh, being materialized, we need to accept that maybe our electricity cost at um, uh, price will be in, will will be increased uh, in the future. But we look for for this. We look we look to how to handle this 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 increasing tariff. Okay, okay. perhaps Mas Wigit can help answer the second questions about what can the conservation conserve conservation industry can uh, take part in this renewable energy. Maybe you have some thoughts on this. I just want to share one of the literature that I've read because basically there is a, one of the component of Greenport criteria also that I haven't mentioned before this, that is a social participation. So I think one of the main point is in here because community promotion and education also play parts in, in the uh, you know, uh, introduction of the Greenport concept or even renewable energies, the development of renewable energies. So what could be done by uh, communities like uh, like uh, from the, the audience is just to, as I said earlier, to collaborate with other stakeholders. Maybe you can start by, uh, uh, by, by contacting researchers like Pak Ahmad or uh, government or even uh, many other companies that do have a corporate social responsibility right, program that that match with the development of the green port or even the renewable energies. So that's also one of my points to add. Well, thank you both amazing speakers today. We have learned a lot about marine renewable energy. Unfortunately, our discussions today uh, is limited by time. Hopefully the sessions today has enriched the perspectives and understandings about towards the topic. And I think this is the end of the sessions, and I I give it back to the Ed America. Thank you so much to our speakers along with our moderator for today's informative session, and we hope everyone enjoyed the session so much. 
and found it valuable as well. So earlier in this event, we asked the audience a question, if you remember, and the question for today was, true or false, marine renewable energy is an important mitigation effort against climate change. And the correct answer to that is true. The use of natural resources in a sustainable energy supply contributes to reduce carbon emissions while minimizing impacts on the marine environment. Shout out to today's lucky one at Jan Pierre Kasama from Instagram for answering correctly. Thank you so much to everyone who has participated. Don't forget to turn the next time and catch a change to get a live shout out from us. And now, do you want to develop more brilliant ideas with a platform like this? It's easy as ABC. You can simply go to our website at www.atamerica.or.id, select create an event and go to collaborate with us. All event proposals will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. You can also subscribe to our newsletter if you find yourself enjoying this event so you can stay updated with our upcoming events as well. Follow us on our social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at AT America for interesting contents, giveaways, and so much more. Also, please click the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. With that, it is time to say farewell. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Asna. See you on the next at America event. Bye-bye, everybody.